means to you know communicate with each other yes. about what we're doing, yeah. know what is going on yeah. in the conversations. Mm. Um, but to actually prioritise the time, I think it's super dope. Yeah. 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 But it might be because it's. Does that help things? Yes. yes. Okay. Well, let's see this one. This is the important one. Now it's gone green again. Why did it come up for a second and now it's gone away? <laughs> it must just strain the desk. Yeah, but it was. That. No, it doesn't. It just doesn't like it when you go to the other screen. Can you do it that way, or is that going to be? Nice? No. Well, I don't. Will it stay there? No. See, every time, every time I change it, it comes up and then it disappears. Yeah, I might just turn it off. Um, that's in the recording. What are they doing? Um, yeah, that's just not working. I can use, I can use this. Over there, but over here there's like a the green recording. screen on the it recording. Oh. It's not, yeah. He is currently undertaking a PhD here at Flinders on neoliberalism, higher education and student power. Broadly, his research interests are exploring the history of student activism and agency in higher education, autoethnographically, what a word, <laughs> investigating current neoliberal moves undermining, undermining democracy in higher education and theorising the future of student governance in higher education institutions in Australia. Aidan is experienced in researching primary, secondary and tertiary education and is an education consultant working with teachers and leaders implementing innovative practice across schools in South Australia. The title of his talk is Designing an Ethnography. Thank you. Aiden. Thank you. Why that? I'm assuming that people can just crank their volume up and will be able to hear me. So I think that's coming through. Yeah, it, it seems like it'll be all good. All right, um, thanks for the introduction, Hannah. So I'm gonna talk through designing and doing an ethnography today. Um, I've done this talk now. I did this first for some um, masters, research students, and then the education honors group. Um, and so I've done a lot of tweaking and changing to this to try and get it sort of looking more like here's the actual process which I followed when designing my first study, which I'm no longer doing. Um, but it's, I think, an interesting thought exercise is to see how people piece together their methodology method and the research area and actually step through the whole, the whole lot from a sociological perspective. So um, I am an educational sociologist, which is my background, so I did honours in sociology of education um, and became really interested in ethnography as a way of examining culture. <clears throat> 
moving forward from there. So before I go any further, I just want to acknowledge that the land we meet on today is the land of the Ghana people, land which was never ceded. Um, I'd like to acknowledge, I shouldn't move, that won't see me. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Ghana people's continuing connections to these lands, skies and water. Um, and finally, I wish to extend my respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders present. So, I started at the beginning of my PhD, which is a bit of a year and a half ago, um, with what I thought was a really great idea. Um, I was going to find all that out about science, technology, engineering and maths, education, policy, implementation, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, it was interesting, it was popular, it hadn't been well done, it was a contentious issue, lots of teachers vying over whether STEM was even a real thing or whether we needed to focus on it. There was career potential, um, there was at that time, there was a professorship of STEM education uh, opened and I was like, I'm, I'm setting my sights on that, like lofty goals for the beginning of a PhD, I know. Um, my advisors had asked for it and it filled a research gap, which, you know, what more could you ask for? But I wanted it to be a bit different. I didn't just want to do a policy analysis because there were tons of those and none of them had been done on STEM policy yet, but you know, policy is pretty boring. So I wanted to actually look at it from a school and see how teachers were looking at these new requirements coming in. And so what I did is I started with a context. I went, well, where can I plonk this thing? And I think this is an important part of designing a cultural inquiry is that we actually look at where and what, you know, how what's going to be interesting about the place. So I started somewhere sort of rich culturally speaking, um, not just starting with that sort of superficial phenomena, that STEM education piece, because I was like, well, I've got that now, now where can I put this that it's going to be interesting? Um, and I think it's an important thing to think about that you make, if you're going to do an ethnography, that you make it something that's interesting to you too, just like any other study that you might do as a PhD or a master's or an honours. Um, it's something that you're going to have to stick with. You're going to have to do this thing, um, you know, for up to three years in some cases. So it's important that you don't go, oh, why did I sign up to do this? And, you know, like, you might think about my STEM policy thing and go, oh, my God, what an idiot. You know, that's really boring. Um, and so, you know, I wanted it to be interesting. So my advice then is start big. Go, what's the general, where, where can I actually do this study? Where can I put it physically? Yet even bigger than that, what's around that area? You know, what cultural influences, how does this all come together? What do we know about this place and space and time? Um, and then you can start to get specific. So my original study was, hopefully this will play, was situated here, um, which is, as you'll see in a minute, right out in the middle of pretty well nowhere, um, which made for a very interesting culture, um, so Adelaide's the blue dot, actually Flinders is the blue dot, and we were somewhere there-ish, I reckon, um, which was Coober Area School. Um, so sort of a, a very rich, interesting history of a place. Um, it's somewhere that's got like a mining background, it's got a lot of Indigenous Australians, um, there's a whole lot of different migrants, a very high population of new migrant Indian people have come through. So it's an interesting place with lots of different people and a very diverse, culturally rich and interesting background. So an interesting place to situate any study, I, I suspect. Um, but then, as with all studies, you sort of have to get a little bit specific. You've got to get narrower and sort of hone in on what it is I'm actually going to find out. What will I produce? What can I learn from this place? Um, and so what we know now is that I was going to go and do some research about a remote school somewhere out in the outback, essentially. Um, and I wanted to look at the cultural construction of teachers' work. So what is it that teachers do? How is that influenced by culture? And how is that influenced by policy? Um, and the analysis of that, I hoped, was going to help me find out how teachers were implementing policy, right? So getting back to that original question of, we've got this STEM policy, this new thing that they have to address. I'm gonna find out how teachers are actually addressing that, handling that, and dealing with that. So the first thing you do when you're doing a research studies, you go to the literature and you find out where this all fits. Um, and STEM policy and remote schooling was a really interesting and very, very big gap. Um, so we're sort of sitting in a policy context where educational institutions make themselves auditable, we have increased national standardised testing, there's school league tables, schools competing as firms, um, competencies for teachers being assessed as, as auditable performances, like checklists of things that teachers are expected to do. 
um, education being moved away from being this intellectual, critical thinking area towards this series of can my student do this, yes, no. Um, and a lot of focus on positivist research, so looking at particularly survey research to figure out what works for kids, like, you know, does this or does this not work, yes, no, um, and not a lot of emphasis on what are the actual barriers or enablers to implementation of policy, um, which, you know, is not to detract from, let's say, doing survey research, but if we've also got a complete lack of picture about how things get implemented, how can we actually make meaningful progress? So what does all of that background mean for my research question? So the focus then became teachers' navigation of social structures or um, you know, things like policies and support that they were provided with in the highly contextual culture of the school. So again, that interesting context that they're working within, they've got a number of things that support them and a number of things that constrain them. And that creates a perfect situation for an ethnographic inquiry. And so a number of questions come out of that, things like what do we mean by policy navigation, what are the cultural differences that impact the widespread of policy changes, and are teachers in charge of how they implement strategies in their own classrooms? What level of control do they have over these new things that are coming at them? And then that might give us the research question, which was my original research question, um, where are the possibilities for teachers agency in a remote school implementing new policy? So possibilities obviously being a key word, and agency in that space, which gave me the research aim, um, that I wanted to make clear the ways teachers are being sort of made or remade in this policy agenda, how this regime is affecting teachers' ability to do what they see as their jobs. Um, and that, I, I argue, is a cultural inquiry. So what I then did is went and wrote all that up in a proposal, went to ethics, did all that fun stuff. Um, and started in a brand new role working as a consultant for all of the schools in the far north. Um, and one of the early workshops that I was party to uh, was one where the um, director of the education department came out to talk to, I think it was about 160 teachers, all gathered in a room from all over the far north of South Australia, um, and they delivered this talk. And what I've got here is a, is a bit of a mixture of um, two different ways of looking at this. So the black text, the darker text, is um, me literally taking a quote from what this um, presenter said. Um, and the blue text is me talking about how the room felt. Um, and so he was saying, you know, SACE is everyone's business. So that's the, the year 12 results, essentially. Everyone's business, that's your mantra. There's this real focus on goals, performance, accountability, achievement, progression, making sure that all the kids progress and achieve the best that they can, which sounds good on the surface, but there's a lot of language around accountability and performance that teachers have to give, um, you know, moving, moving forward. So, you know, an interesting way to set the context of this study. And then you kind of, you gather this kind of data in an ethnography and you have to ask, what would an observation like this, what could these notes tell us about the research question? What are some of the things that could come out of this that might actually get us closer to answering those questions? And so I've bolded their words that I was sort of looking for as um, big indicators of, of policy regimes or, or pushes um, in certain directions. So now, let me take a step back and be really clear. And ethnography is the study of people in a naturally occurring setting. And it involves a lot of observation. It involves interviewing, document analysis, and all kinds of other things. It takes place in neighborhoods, hospitals, schools, community centers, all over the place. It happens in universities. Anywhere there's a culture that can be examined. And that includes places like going overseas and working in um, remote communities or um, all kinds of things. So there's a lot of different ways that ethnographies can be used. Ethnography comprises of sort of three major method, method pieces. So participant observations, interviews, and documentary analysis. Um, and ethnography sort of lets you mix methods. So you can combine your ethnography with things like surveys. You can combine it with things like discourse analysis. It's very broad um, and pretty flexible, which is pretty neat. So participant observation then, what is that? So if I were to do a participant observation of this room, I could start by doing things like counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, how many people are in here? I can start by thinking about what kinds of thoughts and attitudes people in the room might be having. You know, I'm sitting here going, what is this guy talking about? What's a, what's a participant observation? Oh my God. 
I just want to go to bed. You know, there's all sorts of things that you can start to think about reading people's attitudes and faces in the room. Um, and you would be taking a lot of notes, right? So part of participant observation is to document how you're feeling, how you think other people are feeling, what you're seeing. You guys might be writing notes like, I'm watching this presentation, talking about participant observation. That's something I've never heard of. I don't, it's not for me. Just, you know, I don't think that's very interesting. Or you might be writing things like, there's a lot of pressure on me to do X, Y, and Z by the end of the day, and I'm sitting in this room waiting for this talk to finish so I can go back to my office and write something. You know, like there's all sorts of things that can be going on and you take notes of all of that stuff. So that's part of, all part of participant observation. And so for this study that I'm sort of framing up, I was taking on the role of pure participant observation, which means that you go into a new place um, and you start a new role, brand new job in a new setting, um, and you research something that's reasonably unfamiliar. So participant observation is then embedded in a context the observer needs to come in there and win the acceptance of a new role. So you're starting a new job, first day on the job, and at the same time, you're also trying to collect data. You're trying to observe how you feel, how other people feel about your presence, write about that, and also start a new job in a new place. So you're adding these like two quite um, you know, high requirement things to your, you know, what you need to do moving forward. You know, it's like a lot of I don't know, emotional strain or uh, lots of things to think about, lots of problems that can come up. Just something to think about. So then interviews are the other method that sit in there. Um, and you, the nice thing about ethnography compared to perhaps other forms of social research is that you're in the context of your participants. And so if they say something, you know, they use an acronym even, and it's something that you know, you're aware of because you're also in that context with them. You're living and experiencing it alongside of them you get a lot of that contextual information because you're taking notes of that and you're really aware of the context that they're in because you're immersed in it with them. And so you can sort of maybe read into some of the things that they're telling you, what they're saying, what they're feeling and what they're thinking, and you can get really rich contextual information around the culture that you're studying. And also as to this thick description. So the question then, becomes, well, what would we ask our participants? And because you're embedded in this context, usually for, you know, anywhere from six months to a year, you spend a long time there and you can't really like pre-plan all your interviews. It's, that's a lot of work to do. So you need to think about you know, what might I ask them? And so you can ask them things maybe when you first get there about how has this been done here before? You know, like how have you implemented new policies in the past? Or how do you feel about these new policies arriving? And as you go along, you might see them facing challenges. You know, like in a school context, for example, you might see a, you know, an incident in the schoolyard where you know, there's some bullying happening and you could maybe ask the teacher who observed that directly to give you some insight into what happened there as well as add your own description and understanding of that and then gather information from other people in the context. So you can piece together, I guess, triangulation of events as they, as they transpire and you can really build sort of a, an interesting um, dynamic around critical events as they occur. So ethnography, I think the important part here is that ethnography gives us opportunities to see things from a lot of different people's perspectives um, and piece together a really clear picture of events as they transpired from all of these different angles, which can be quite interesting, but it's also a lot of data. Um, speaking of providing context, document analysis also helps with that. So um, lots of publications and things come out of like almost everywhere. I mean, just think about the university, for example, there is like actual publications coming out all the time, there's reports about meetings, there's minutes, there's notes, all of that stuff can also aid your ethnography, you can build that in, you can add to that context, it's all more research data um, to collect. So my thing here is, you know, capture everything that you can, data generated from official correspondence, from meeting minutes, and all other texts, they can provide context and different perspectives for your story. always be writing observations. <laughs> Every bit of data that you have will help you build your story and help you have a better study. If you don't have it, it becomes hard to remember and hard to write about. Like if you don't record all of the data that you can, you're not gonna have it at some point later down the track, but you can record useless data and then throw it out later. So it's better to have it and not need it, etc. You've got to have a really good filing system for this stuff because obviously you've got a lot of interview transcripts, you've got a lot of documents that you've collected, you've got a lot of um, observations that you've written. You've got to keep that all together and file it really cleverly because otherwise you're going to have a really bad time when it comes to analysing it. 
Um, it might make sense right now when you're filing your interviews or whatever in folders, but if you come back to it again in a year and you're expecting yourself to remember what happened on that day and sort of build that context around it, that can get really murky. So, you know, come up with a good filing system and note-taking system. Um, ethnography uniquely solves some of the problems that we typically hear about qualitative research. So there's things like, um, you know, generalizability or um, how do we know it's reliable or valid because we're getting lots of different perspectives and you know I keep saying there's all these different people feeding you information so how do I know you know where is the truth is there a truth in this and what can I pull out of this and is it generalizable you know how do I how do I counter some of those claims and so an ethnography gives you the ability to sort of look at things like well is it reliable well okay five people told me the exact same thing so I'm you know probably pretty close to a, a good interpretation of this thing and it also gives you that ability to look at things from all the different perspectives, which means that you know, you'll get the, the, a feel for whether there's maybe some truth to this that could be useful in another context. So some of that generalizability sort of becomes a little bit clearer as well. There's also stacks of other stuff to think about in an ethnography. You've got reflexivity, critical ethnography, interpretive ethnography. Can you report data objectively? Is that even possible? Are you writing art or science? Are you writing a story or a report? Does your methodology clarify your reliability? And they're all questions that you have to ask about pretty well any study in some kind of format. Like the, these questions will translate in some way towards anybody's study. It's just the way that you ask them might be a bit different. But it's in, interesting to think about, you know, how, how does my study go together? How do I know that I'm getting something good out of this? And is this going to be useful? In all ethnographies, I think the aim is to move beyond just description. We don't just want to go, I came to the international room and I heard a talk about ethnography. It's like, cool, what does that tell us? Is that useful? What do we know about that? You know, what, well, what's the convention here? You know, what's a talk? What format is this? Why is there a person standing at the front of the room with people sitting around listening? You know, to dig into some of that culture around what are the norms, what are the expectations, and how does this all play out? So go beyond description and start thinking critically about what's going on. And in that way, ethnography can become quite unique because you live an experience alongside your participants. You, you feel as much as you see and write. You, you feel in the room with people as they hear three of you are losing your job. You feel that as much as the rest of the people in the room do. It's, it's, you're living that with them. It's, it's sort of that experience is shared. And so you need to record what you feel along with what you see and what you hear. Um, observation does not mean not feeling you need to empathise with your participants and don't lose that feeling because that's what I think makes an ethnography really unique. We want to write compelling work even if it is a scientific, if you're trying for a scientific style writer, you still want to write something compelling. You want, you want it to be interesting to read. You don't want it to sit on a shelf and get dusty. So it's worth thinking about how you tell the story and whether that adds or subtracts from what it is that you're doing. Is it going to be more artistic or scientific? You want to use your story to critique, expand and explore ideas in depth. You want to dig into the cultural phenomenon. What's going on around you? How do I get into that and find out more? Why, why does this happen? What's the meaning of this thing? Again, don't just write an anthropological report. So there's other things that I had to consider for this ethnography, which, again, I never got to do. Um, access to sites and people. So it's like when you commence a study like this, you actually need to be able to go somewhere and do it. Uh, and you need to be able to talk to people that will help you get into that site. Like I had to rock up at a school and be like, hey, let me in, I want to do some research on you. And they're like, what, what, what's the motivation? Why should I let you in there? What's the, you know, what are you going to do for me? You're just, you're going to sit in the staff room and write notes about me? I don't think so. You know, it's, there's some really interesting things to consider around access. And so I was fortunate enough to be able to get into this cluster of schools as a consultant. So I was able to sort of provide them with some training around project-based learning and other things. Um, and then that gave me sort of a reason to be in the school context. But once you're in, it's not just a matter of having the gatekeepers, the people that let you in and let you into the room. It's about finding people in the room that can show you where to go, who to talk to. You know, once you arrive in a, in a site like a school, it's like, well, now how do I start a conversation with teacher X about this thing that's going on? Because, I, you know, you've just rocked up and I don't know you, you're this new person. So there's a lot of things to think about how you build that rapport 
how you sort of show people that you're there genuinely to, to listen to them and to you know, hopefully help them. Lots of things to think about. So that's your role at the site. And you've got to really work to establish trust with your participants because there's, you know, they're going to, you're hoping that they'll tell you how they're feeling, how they're thinking, how things are unfolding. You know, they're not going to do that if they don't trust you and vice versa. All right, so throwing out that study, um, I've now pivoted to, <laughs> just, just chuck that all out. Um, I've now pivoted to, this is my current PhD. So I'm looking at student activism um, in an auto-ethnographic sense. So the auto in ethnography is, is literally just um, putting yourself in as one of the key actors in the context. I'll get more to that in a minute. So my question now is what are the possibilities for student activism or agency here and now? What are the possibilities for us as students to rebel against the system or maybe not rebel against the system? And in doing that, part of that work is to put on the student activist hat. So I go out and I, you know, I have my petition out and I've got my sign and I you know, have a chant or I gather people at the steps of the registry building, etc. Or maybe not. Maybe it's more like working inside the institution in the students as partners workshops or it's getting other students involved and interested in governance perspectives or getting on committees. Um, you know, there's all kinds of ways that that can play out and you live that as part of your ethnography. So autoethnography just adds the autobiography, so you write your own experience, your own history alongside that of the participants, your interviews and your document analysis, so it just adds another method, squeezes that in there as if it, as if it wasn't enough. And you live it, you're not just studying it, you're not just there in your lab coat, you're down in the hub with your, your petition and you, you know, your friends. And you're always recording as much as you possibly can. Um, Again, I'll always be writing observations. Every night I go home and write a big long list about all the things that I've, I've done in relation to student partnership or student activism, um, which I'm not doing anymore. Don't worry, none of you will feature in it unless you really want to. Um, <laughs> but you're always recording and gathering as much data as you possibly can. Ethnography in that sense, and autoethnography particularly, but ethnography involves becoming deeply embedded in the culture you're researching. And it's worth thinking about how you then withdraw yourself from that culture to go and actually write a thesis. It's like, how do I stop being part of this situation in order to go and analyze and think about and write this up? Um, so again, if the culture doesn't interest you, it's probably not a good area because you're gonna be there for a, a long while working with these people. And it's like, if you hate them, it's not, don't you, bad area for study. Um, again, be prepared to take a lot of notes and write a lot of reflections, ask a lot of questions and stay critical. You're living in this context, so you can't. You have to stay reflexive. It's like, what, am, what is my presence doing to the people that I'm working with here? It's like, just because I walk in the room and people maybe know that I'm doing a study or thinking about what we're doing here, you know, like I rock up at a student's, part, students' partners workshop and there's 30 odd students in the room and I'm in there and, you know, maybe I stick my hand up and go, hey, just, you know, so everybody knows I'm doing an ethnography and, you know, I'm gonna take some observations today. Do people's attitudes when talking to you suddenly change? Do they stop telling you the whole story? Maybe they feel a bit reticent to talk about certain topics because you know, oh, they, that person might take notes on me. So this, you've got to think about what impact you're having on people in the room. And importantly, I think you have to think about your mental health well-being and your, your physical, like your body, how you're feeling, all of those kinds of things. It's an important part of any study, but in an ethnography where you're living it and you're part of this culture or this scene, um, you have to be particularly aware of whether there's an impact happening on you as you sort of live it. And so just to wrap up, um, what I thought I'd do is just go through, this is, this is what I'm calling the middle bit. This is an observation that I've sort of worked up. So I go home and I write all these notes. Um, and then somewhere along the way, you go from these scribbled observations and maybe some interviews and bits and pieces, and you've got to work that into a story before you can then take it away and analyse it. And so this is that middle bit, and it's almost never in textbooks. So I'll, I'll read this out just because, you know, everybody loves a bit of reading. Um, <laughs> so we had, until that point, engaged full-heartedly in activism within the institutional bounds as academic activists. Admittedly, we had not performed academia in the traditional sense. None of us had tweed jackets with elbow patches. Maybe that's how it fell apart. But when I succumbed to pivoting attention towards rallies, protests, and banners, over intellectual engagement, word of mouth, and community building, that's when things started to go backwards. Hindsight really is 2020. 
Suddenly, energies that were focused on offering powerful institutional critique, targeting and building support from faculty, and engaging with students who actually had a basic intellectual framework to engage in institutional activism was diverted. Rather than targeting students who wanted to change things from within and providing them with support to radicalize, we'd begun to embody the radical student of the 60s. It felt good. Organizing large groups of people was powerful. With little effort, we were able to summon a room full of students, more than 50 on one occasion, just to discuss possible actions in a protest. We could have burnt it down, in a meta metaphorical sense, possibly literal, with this group. We had the student president, we had members of the socialist alternative from three universities, we had the vice president of the NTEU, we had drawn in students of international relations, education, science, history, politics, data science and engineering. This room contained the most diverse clustering of students and staff from across the institution. It would prove to be a waste. The room was asked what actions would make the most impact. Now admittedly, admittedly I'm not normally one for acknowledging something like bias, but in this instance, I think bias is a clarifying concept with relation to the powerful influences abound. We had a room comprised of half professional activists, those of the Sultan Union contingents, and the other half were students who were concerned about what was happening to their lecturers and supervisors. So you certainly would not color me surprised when suddenly rallies were being organized, placards were being painted, speeches were to be given. What might this mean for those students who were not ready for raising it to the ground, you might ask? I'm not going to sing to you, but um, the, the words of a Vampire Weekend song here might give us an insight. Anger wants a voice, voices want to sing, etc, etc. And what I'm doing there, just as a quick side note, is trying to raise some sort of artistic understanding of, of what's going on. And so you could ask the question, is my ethnography more like art or like science, when you start bringing in things like song groups? And finally, just to round that story out. We had provided a forum for some angry people to create a series of events that would let them do what they had always done and done well. Rather than channeling their energies towards something productive, we gave them exactly what they expected. We gave them protest. For the rest, the appeal was lost. Energies continued to rise. We gathered members of the action group at my house to create banners, signs and strategize upcoming actions. It really seemed like this was a good course of action. Of course, having had no experience in organising activism, why wouldn't it? And we definitely produced some pretty signs. Protest day came sooner than you could have imagined, and then the wheels fell off. Council speeches were approved at the last minute, and the support of those 50, or 285 interested on Facebook, never trust Facebook, became the support of 15. Staff outnumbered students, and the Vice-Chancellor came. Sadly, I don't think he was there to protest the 2025 agenda implementation. All right, that's it, that's me. <laughs> that's brilliant, Peyton, thank you. Um, so if we can do questions and comments, um, if you could just put your hand up so I can give you the mic, because we are being recorded. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Aidan, that was so awesome. Uh, it's really good to hear your writing, read and hear your writing because, uh, yeah, it's a real insight into the tone, you know, like how all of that sort of comes yeah. to bear. Yeah. So that, that was really good. Um, my question, I suppose, is about, um, yeah, you were talking before about being new in a place yeah. and researching it at the same time, mm. but what, what happens if you're already in a place mm. and, and then you put on a research hat? Yeah. And your role certainly sort of changes. Yeah, yeah. And so the trust yeah. relationships that you might have built up with people naturally mm. are suddenly different. Mm. Or, or, that, or that's yeah, yeah, for sure. comes under risk. So yeah. um, I'm just trying to sort of separate your, your two. Yeah. yeah. So in the yeah. second one, you were already here, yes. in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of, yeah. So how did. Did you yeah. know the difference? It's 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 interesting. Like it, it's a it was a very different thing because it's like there was all of that. I guess it's almost anxiety to to an extent. You know, of going into a school and starting a brand new job and then also trying to report research data and observations. But it's like when you um, you know that comes to an end, but then you sort of are still in this context of being a, like I mean, as I was a university student, I suppose you're still doing that and living that. But actually, I think for me, the 
you know, the protest stuff, the that sort of rebellion or activism, um, that was almost like picking up a new role because I hadn't done that before. And okay, yes, like the relationships that I had with many of those people were the step were the same, like they continued. Um, but actually, I think it's almost like I'd stayed in the same context or same place and started a whole new um, a whole new role still, even though it's the same same context. But yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting. That's a really, a really good question. Um, but it's an interesting thing to sort of to think about. I don't I don't think that my um, like everybody everybody that I spoke to sort of knew that I was taking observations and taking notes. And I don't really think of there was any times where um, I was like significantly like like ignored or um, people weren't interested in talking to me because I you know was doing research in this context. And I I, I don't know how it would have changed because I didn't do it without also taking notes and doing all those things. So, you know, without having lived that life again, without any research overlay, you know, I, I don't know, but... So, like, was that a role? Or is, or is that you now? I think, well, I think that... Hmm. Yeah, good question. Um, I think that is partly... Mm -hmm. That was partly a role, but it is also part of me now moving forward. Um, I've, you know, like, I've sort of pivoted on the activism thing, like I've moved away from like let's go, you know, wave our banners around um, and let's, you know, do a march and a parliament the house and whatever, um, towards, you know, engaging within structures that exist and, you know, hoping to like have a, a conversation with, you know, both staff and students around how they can get more involved in, in governance. So there's definitely a big part of that activism stuff is still with me now. Um, but the stuff my studies ended in that you know that stuff has ended now so and that continues and I guess those relationships continue so I think in some way yes I am carrying that along but it's also pivoted again a bit too so it's almost like you could almost look at the study as this period of time where I radicalized in a sense um, and did all of these things and took all of these notes and did all this like documentary stuff around that um, and then that all sort of neatly wrapped up and now I've pivoted back and sort of turned back into myself, but carried some of those, you know, interests with me post the research. So yeah, it's a, you might end up writing policy that's and it. come full circle. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yeah. Absolutely. I got one for you. Cool. Um, so ethnography is obviously quite different to what we're used to in psychology. So yeah, in psych, we're very much trying, attempting to observe from over here, trying mm. not to influence the mm. context yep. as much as possible. Yeah. Whereas ethnography is the complete opposite. So you dive yeah. in and immerse yourself. Yeah. You spoke a little bit about uh, mental well-being mm. and physical well-being as well. How do you, and obviously you talked about having, you know, with the student activism, you became quite involved yourself. Yeah. How do you design, or is it part of the design of an ethnography where you can still immerse yourself but also protect yourself mm. to an extent? Mm. Yeah, How do you handle that, that? that's also a good question. I think there's, mm. Mm. <laughs> um, no, that's cool. Um, it's, it, it's almost like, for me anyway, I, sure about other people but it's almost like you take on this researcher identity it's like I'm I'm here and I'm going to do these things because it's it's what these other people you know like what these other people are doing and they're participating in these movements and, and doing these things they're organizing this action um, and I'm going to do that too with them I'm going to you know dive straight in and go full on with them and, and do it um, but it's almost because I'm here to learn more about how this works it's almost like you have like a bit of a buffer. There's like a you know like a shell between you and the outside world. I don't really know how to explain that, but it's it is almost part of thinking about the design of it. It's almost like how am I going to maintain my sense of who I am and what I'm interested in when you know can you if you're going to become fully part of a context you know is that context is always going to sort of rub off on you in some way. It's going to change who you are, and I think you know that's, that's similar to Nick's question is the same those sort of dovetail in the sense that as I now carry some of those ideas with me in terms of, you know, I want to address governance, etc. Um, yeah, that, you know, it's like bits of that study have changed me and I'm sure bits of me changed that study and 
yeah, it is important, of course, that you sort of keep in mind, is that having a, a bigger impact on your well-being? Um, but I think it's also that's also quite rewarding in, in some senses because it's like you're taking with you this really interesting and unique experience that you've had. You get to keep that. You know, as the researcher, you maybe don't even write about it because it's just sort of becomes part of you. So I don't know, but there are there's lots of there's lots of writing around ethnography around how people have had like doing quite intense ethnographies where they you know they might even look into like like they go into sex work or they you know go into a, a drug scene or go and live with criminals. You know, there's lots of things in in those contexts, and it's like people will break the law and do all kinds of quite extreme things as a researcher in the name of, well, I'm recording what these people are doing and I'm interested in, it's like, but also you just bought and took a whole lot of drugs, you know, <laughs> so it's like, and then how are you managing your well-being? You're probably not because you're not looking after yourself. You're so intent on chasing this outcome, answering this research question, whatever that is, that you've, you know, let go of your own well-being in that process. So it's, it is interesting. I think you kind of need to have a, a person that, anchors you through that and you know hopefully with a PhD that's your supervisors they sort of help you keep rooted to who you are and whatever but yeah I mean obviously it's a spectrum awesome. thank you hey <coughs> hey Eddie. hi good talk enjoyed it thanks <laughs> um, am I right to say that your motto had not the something that you came across <laughs> trial by fire that you, you, you found that your nose was so good but you had to sorry you had to uh, if you didn't do that cobbling it was hard to recreate the, the yep. story yeah and so my question is do you reflect upon that because your emotions your impressions of the situation will mm. change mm. presumably yeah so do you have a component does ethnography in general have a component where you reflect upon I, you know I thought this three months ago now yeah. I think this about what happened. I yeah. mean, does it evolve? And... But yeah, I, I, that, I mean that's another really good question. I think so. Yes, there's there is definitely. It depends. It depends what tradition of ethnography. But yes, there are ethnographies that will have like a, I don't know, a self-diagnostic thing. It's kind of like you go through like you've written all these notes and then you write. Here's how I felt about it. I thought you know I thought, felt really positively about this event at the time. You know. I was, you know, this was going to be really good, we're going to be really productive. And then you can come back and go, well, now I'm looking at it, that was really stupid. Because again, like, it's that hindsight's 2020 thing. It's being able to come back around and look at, well, what actually transpired now that we look back. And yeah, your feelings and things change over time looking at the same events. Um, so I, yeah, definitely have tried to account for that as much as I can in the sense that, you know, at the time I was feeling positive and like, these things were going to work. And now I look back at them and I go, well, that was dumb. <laughs> What did I do that for? Um, so, I think to an extent, yes, that's that's part of it, but it's not necessarily part of all ethnographies because I think that is probably something that you learn by doing. It's you know you kind of become aware of this. My feelings about this thing that happened have changed now that I look back, and it's in catching yourself doing that, going, "What was I doing? Why was I being such an idiot? You know, undertaking that. You know, we did that protest. Like, why did we do that? We'd already had one. You know, like, what?" What was I thinking? You know, I could have done X, Y, and Z instead. And you've got to catch yourself going, well, at the time, I did it, so I must have thought something was going to come of it. So, you know, what was I thinking then? What am I thinking now? So if you didn't take that note then, that can be a bit harder. But, you know, I did take, take notes of how I was feeling about things and whether I thought they were going to be a success or not. So, yeah. But, yes, no, it's absolutely something that I think is important is to keep track of how your feelings about things have changed. And, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So how do you get ethics for something like that? Yep. Um, <laughs> the, the ethics committee don't, uh, they don't really like ethnography. No. Um, <laughs> it's interesting because it's like they have, there is a box on the ethics form for observation, um, but they're going, they're thinking like you're going to go and do, I'm going to do six observations of, you know, this teacher teaching this class, I'm going to go and observe that and write my notes about it and then I'm going to leave. You know, they're not like I'm going to go and be there permanently. 
um, so there was a lot of back and forth. I think I had like 11 revisions that I had to go through with that original set, and I still didn't have, at the end of that, I still didn't have ethical approval for the whole lot. They'd given me like conditional approval. I could go and do interviews, but I wasn't yet allowed to do my observations because they weren't quite sure whether that was allowed. So, you know, like it was a really, it was a very ongoing process. Um, and eventually it, it ends up being like, you start to write it for the ethics committee in such a way that it's not true to what you want to do anyway. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to tell you I'm going to do 155 observations because that's how many I think I might do across the year. And I'm going to tell you what I think I'm going to be observing, but how can I possibly know? And so you start writing all of that and you like record all of these things that you think you're going to do and they give you like 100 different consent forms that you've got to give your participants. Um, and it's like, I got to a point there where they were telling me, yeah, okay, it's all good, you can do it, but you need them to sign every day. When you come to school in the morning, you need to get them to sign a consent form for interview, a consent form for observation, and a consent form for um, something else. Like there's like three different consent forms that they want to do every day with all of the teachers in the room. And I'm like, I do, that's not going to work. They're going to get like driven crazy by signing all these forms. So there is a, there is a lot of like swing around. Process, um, and I never did get to the bottom of that. So it, it's it's quite a challenge to get through to get through ethics on that front. When I did this one, I just because what I did was I just took notes of what I'd been doing. Like I took notes about myself, what I was feeling, what I was seeing, how things were playing out, and then writing a record, like almost like a journalist writing a record of like, you know I went and I did this today. I wasn't directly involving other people in that process. I just went, like, I'm just going to write this. So, um, so if you're observing something, you know, you're writing about your reaction to that or something, yep. and uh, do you have to take care to de-identify? I have done. Yeah, yeah. I have done. I, it's not. It's, it hasn't. Like none of that's actually clear ethics because there's no real way to report that. Like I can't go. I was living in this context and I took some notes. Like they don't have a. There's no box for that. And so I've written about that. Like as I'm doing now, actually doing the ethics for this project. So I'm going to go back and do interviews with them. Because the ethnographic component's already done, it's like it, it's an interesting sort of position to be in. It's like I I took notes and I de identified people just naturally. I came up with these like aliases for people and I put this like complex map of all my aliases and whatever. And of course, I'll take like a lot of care to make sure that nobody is identified. And anybody that I did actually include in those reflections, I talked to. Like I said, look, I'm, I'm going to go home and write notes about this. Is it all right if I, you know, give you an alias and just write about these, these events that transpired today? I did that in, in like a biographical sense, centering around me and my actions, but also, you know, these people did X, Y, and Z, using, you know, different aliases for them. But yeah, I don't know how you actually approach ethics for clearance for that because it's not something that's on the form. Quite, it's quite difficult you know, way of dealing with it, you know, like thinking about how do I how do I actually report this ethically speaking? Because now what I'm saying in my current ethics application, which I seem to be okay with, I ask the question, um, is that I'm using a secondary data set that's already been collected and it's de-identified. So in that sense, they're okay with that, but it's like, well, but I shouldn't have been able to collect that in the first place, theoretically, according yeah, yeah. to your rules, you know. That's right, it's a net and things are slipped through, right? And that's it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, that's it. That's really gel in the past. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Yeah, 
yeah, it, it's, it's it's interesting too because I mean my role in that in that school context was as someone to support their implementation policy in some senses, um, and so there is sort of a fine line there as well around um, you know am I am I part of the problem? Am I forcing you to do things you don't want to be doing? And so so there's, there's all sorts of, you know, what's my influence on these people in this context? Um, so, yeah, and I, honestly, I would argue, like, my position now is almost ethnography and oral ethnography pretty much should just be, it should all just be called ethnography. Because I think, realistically, your, you know, the difference in the literature is typically, and ethnography is about you going to a new place, capturing stories of the people, whereas an autoethnography is I'm... The key actor in this story but what's the difference like you're going to observe and record how you felt what you saw what they felt and what they saw in both of those you know so well then you know like surely that's just the same thing so um yeah i think you're probably being somewhat disingenuous if you do an ethnography and don't record yourself your impact your position in the site because you're not getting the whole picture the whole story is sort of Missing, so yeah. Maybe it's to do with the research question. Mm. Yeah, well, it depends what it does that. depend on what you're after at yeah. the end of the day. Yeah, that's true. Mm. But I mean, either way, I still think you're going to need, you know, regardless of what your research question is, you still have to document what you're doing in that site because yes. otherwise you'll, yeah, you'll lose something in that, that process. So, yeah.